invite you all to move on to the proportion information session. My name is Kath Hannon. I'm the project manager for the Sexual and Reproductive Health Clinical Champion Project based at the Royal Women's. Very proud to welcome you to the session today. It's a combined effort across a number of organisations. Primarily, I want to acknowledge Jess Ellsworth, the Health Promotion Officer from Women's Health in the South East, who's played a key role to bring this event together. The event is part of WISE's Metro South East strategy for sexual and reproductive health called Good Health Shout. I'd also like to acknowledge the contribution of Kathy Helmarek, a nurse practitioner from Peninsula Health, and Michelle Templeton, nurse and project lead for Monash Health in their respective sexual and reproductive health hub roles. And also to South East Metro PHN for organising and promoting the event. Thank you to all for your contribution. And a reminder that this is a second in the series. Last week we had a session uh, in the, on Tuesday evening that was focused on the clinical aspects of providing care and this was targeting GPs and nurses. Um, we have a follow-up session for the third uh, in this series and it's a session that is planned for the 17th of November and the session will be looking at follow-up of the procedure, of the medical abortion procedure and managing complications and again that's targeting clinicians and nurses. Um, we, it's not at the moment on the PHN website but we'll stay in contact with you and let you know when you might be able to, um, to book into that. And there was a recording for, from last week's session. So if you're interested in hearing that recording, let us know and we will send that to you. So our, our contact details will follow. Just firstly, I want to acknowledge, sorry, I'm just getting my next slide up. I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we are on today as we participate in this, in this, in this webinar. In acknowledging country, I ask you to reflect on the country in which you are on today. I'm in uh, Northcote and I would like to acknowledge that this event takes place on the country of the Woodbury people. We pay, pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any First Nations people here today. We acknowledge that Aboriginal sovereignty has not been ceded and remains strong in their enduring connection to land and culture. Just turning to housekeeping and the way um, that we would like the webinar to work, we've allotted uh, just one hour actually, um, not an hour and 15 minutes, so it's a uh, short time slot. Just to remind you that you, can't, you can see us, but we can't see you and you can't see one another. And we recommend that you use the speaker view for this presentation. So go to your top right hand corner of the Zoom and play around with the, the views that you see. So if you choose speaker view, you can see the main image is the PowerPoint and the small image is the presenter. We have a question and answer, answer session uh, at the end. Um, we've allocated some time for your questions and answers. So use the question and answer function during the webinar and we'll get to those at the end. Also, the webinar is being recorded and we will send uh, the recording to you in the next couple of uh, days. So the purpose of the, um, the webinar today, um, I'd like to welcome all participants here today. Uh, to the audience, we thank you for your interest in the event and taking the opportunity to explore your role in medical abortion service delivery and that of the practice that you represent. We know that primary care settings and particularly GP practices are key to safe, timely and accessible care for women and pregnant people. We also know that unintended pregnancy and abortion are common experiences, but despite abortion law reform in Victoria and the availability of the medical abortion procedure, numerous gaps and barriers exist that limit, limit access and availability of the medical abortion service. Our intention is that this event will help break down some of those uncertainties about providing the procedure and facilitate your role and empower you in practice. 
as front of house staff or practice managers, you have a very important role in terms of supporting the woman or pregnant person to be given the right appointment at the right time, with a, also with a non-judgmental and respectful attitude. So this forum is an opportunity to reflect on your role and the thoughts and feelings and the work that is required to provide a medical abortion uh, service within your practice setting. Reception staff are at the front line and depending on the processes and procedures in your practice, you might become aware of your own challenges to your value set and feelings about the procedure. And I invite you to explore and examine your reactions during the session and into the future, perhaps with your colleagues in your practice setting. I'm aware that the abortion procedure has a long history of being shrouded in secrecy and shame for both the women and pregnant people who are thinking about or requesting this care or have had this care or for the clinicians who provide the care. That's why there's a need for forums like this. And the message is that unintended pregnancy and abortion is common and that abortion is, is another component of health care. Medical abortion is safe and effective procedure and an opportunity for women and pregnant people who choose it. And, and sorry, an option for women and pregnant people who choose it. So that's just putting it um, in context and I want to introduce uh, the speakers with us here today. Um, Dr Sarah Jeff is a GP at the Rosebud Superclinic and she'll be talking about integrating medical abortion into her practice. Carolyn Mockabell is the team leader from 1800 and she'll be talking about the role of 1800 and how women and pregnant people in the community can use the database to access services. And I am the project manager, Kat Hannon, the project manager for the Clinical Champion um, project and I'll be putting this work into a context. Um, and we, as I mentioned, we have a Q&A session um, at the end. And we've had a late change in our, per, in our running sheet for the list of presenters. And I'm going to hand over to Caroline uh, Mockabell, who's the team leader from 1800, my options to talk about 1800. And then I'll talk a little bit about the context of this work and then hand over to Sarah. So I'll hand over to you now, Caroline, and I will stop sharing. Thank you, Kath. Uh, so I'll just wait for my presentation to come up, but I'll introduce 1800 My Options for a start. So we are a service funded by the Victorian State Government, and we have been active in Victoria. Uh, our service was first launched in March of 2018, and we've been providing a phone line and web-based service for people all across Victoria since then. You could move to the next one, please, Jess. Thank you. So we are a free phone line that's open from 10 till four every uh, weekday, excluding public holidays, where somebody can call to get trusted evidence-based information about sexual and reproductive health, and particularly about abortion. Um, and people can also have a look on our website for evidence-based information and also to look at services that are near to them. We get up to about 100 calls every week from across Victoria. The calls come from people who are looking for services for themselves, generally women who are looking for abortion. We also get calls from their partners who might be helping them to look for a service. We get calls from GPs who are trying to help them find a service uh, in their local area and also from other practice staff like nurses and practice managers who are supporting their um, staff to be able to find a service that can meet the needs of their patients. Thanks, Jess. So of the callers that we have to 1800 My Options, around over 70% of them are seeking an abortion and are under nine weeks gestation. So these people generally will be eligible for a medical termination. Uh, we know that of the 100 or so calls that we get every week, it, from the southeastern metro part of Melbourne, anywhere from 15 to 22% of our callers are coming from that area. And so we know that there's a significant identified need in Southeast Metro Melbourne for medical abortion services. 
Women tell us on the phones that they prefer medical abortion because of the privacy, being able to do it in the privacy and comfort of their own home. They prefer to see their GP, who they've got a trusted ongoing relationship with, where they can get the continuity of care, more in, in preference to a hospital or abortion clinic. They see the procedure as being less invasive and it's also far more convenient for a lot of women. They don't need to travel to a hospital or an abortion clinic. They don't need to think in as much detail about childcare and generally a medical abortion will be significantly lower in cost. But we do know that there are barriers to medical abortion. We know that in some clinics, a medication abortion can cost around $500, which is a significant amount of money. We know that in some areas of Victoria and of Melbourne, women will have to travel quite a far way to be able to access the medical abortion. We know that often MTOC providers don't advertise their services, which is completely understandable, but it means that it's really difficult to know who to talk to or where to go. Without visibility of the system, women often end up traveling an hour to be able to find a service that isn't necessarily the appropriate one. We also know that there are sometimes significant delays. There's a lot of misinformation about medication abortion, both in the sector um, and in the community. And conscientious objection can also be a really significant barrier for some women. Thanks, Jess. So we work with primary care across Victoria to make the abortion and sexual and reproductive health system more visible to the people that are looking for it. So with our phone line, when somebody calls us, we'll talk through their needs and then we'll provide them with information about where they can go to be able to meet their needs. We generally provide every caller with at least three services that they can contact to make an appointment to book in for the services that they're looking for. So the ways that we work with primary care is that when we have our phone calls, we can refer the callers through to your services. Um, we, don't pro we don't provide referrals to services that haven't registered their information on our website. And that's quite simple to do. You just go to the health professional section of 1800myoptions.org.au click register here and select which services you provide and you would like us to refer women to for you. People can choose to be publicly listed, which means that their information will be visible on our website, or they can choose to be privately listed. So only the people who are answering the calls will be able to see the information about the registration. Some services choose to have both a public and a private registration. That means that they might advertise publicly that they provide contraceptive services like uh, intrauterine devices, but they prefer to keep the abortion services like medication abortion privately listed. And that's a completely uh, useful thing. And we can make changes to the registrations quite quickly and quite easily. We can also work with primary care by providing information about sexual and reproductive health providers in your area. If you have patients who are looking for services that aren't provided in your clinic, and you're also very welcome to refer your patients to our service. Thanks, Jess. So here is the front page of our website. I've circled in red the For Health Professionals. It's on the blue bar towards the top. That's how you can register your services with 1800 My Options. You can also search for healthcare services in the other circled healthcare services button um, if you're looking for local providers of various sexual and reproductive health services. Um, we're also happy for you to contact us directly if you're having any issues with registration or have any questions about the way that our service works. It is completely free to register and you can change the registrations at any time. Sometimes it will take a couple of days for the changes to go live, but we do welcome any changes to make our service work better for primary health. Absolutely. Thanks, Jess. So I'd just like to end on the note and the reminder that we know that around about one in four women worldwide will have an abortion at some point in their lives. Abortion is a very relevant and important part of primary care. And we're quite committed to making sure that we can support primary care to make medical abortion and other sexual and reproductive health services more accessible to people. 
If you've got any questions, again, please don't hesitate to email us info at 1800myoptions.org.au. You can also email me directly. My email address is right there. If you've got any questions about our service, how we can work with you, if you'd like us to send out resources or if you'd like to register, we'd really welcome any feedback and any communication. Thank you. I'll pass back to you, Kath. Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. It's very uh, important to resource in the community to have that um, uh, from 1800 My Options. Uh, sorry, and I'm just going to go. So thanks. Thanks for that. Now, as I said, this, the order's been slightly changed and normally this would be a bit of an icebreaker and, you know, if we're in the room together, it'd be an opportunity to put your hand up or walk around the room. But these, uh, I've left these questions in, um, but they're really just a prompt to think about the content context in which we are providing um, this level of care. So I'll just give you just um, a brief mark just to have a read of those questions and just think about your responses to them. They're true, false responses. If you've got someone next to you, you might want to have a quick chat around it. But just, uh, I'll just be quiet so just have a look at those questions. I'll just give you a brief moment. Okay, so sadly there isn't any interaction, so I'll just um, uh, tell you what, what the answers are. Um, so the first question is, it, it is legal to have an abortion in Victoria, and that is certainly true. So since 2008, Victoria has had the Abortion Law Reform Act, which enables women to make a request of a, a medical practitioner to, uh, to have an abortion up to 24 weeks of pregnancy. Um, and the law also has provision for conscientious objection. So if a medical practitioner um, makes a, a judgment that they don't want to be involved in this level of care, the law um, allows them to do that, but they are obliged to refer to another provider that they know is not a conscientious objector. And in addition, um, uh, there, are, there is provision for safe access zones so that um, people who oppose uh, abortion provider are, are prohibited um, to, um, uh, to have harassing or intimidating behaviour within 150 metres of abortion uh, provider premises. And that usually refers to standalone abortion providers. Um, the second question is: um, people wouldn't need abortions if they were more responsible. And my response to that is that no contraception is 100% effective. That all contraception has some sort of side effect, and it can take some time to find a suitable method. And in addition, that sexual behaviour is not always consensual or predictable. Um, there are times when women um, may not be in a position to negotiate safe sex, either through lack of her, um, of her power and autonomy over decisions that have got to do with sex, and that substances like drugs and alcohol will often get in the way of safe decision making. And the third question is, most women seeking an abortion are aged between 16 and 20 years. Um, that actually the research evidence is that is false, that uh, although we don't keep uh, accurate data and often it's not publicly available and that's why 1800 from my options provides us some really useful uh, data. Um, and they're going on their data, the age group from 26 to 34 years is the most common group requesting a medical abortion service. So that's trying to debunk the myth that it's you know, young, um, young adolescent women who have made their sexual debut 
who are who have an unplanned pregnancy and requesting abortion services, the evidence is that they're they're not the most commonly represented requesting women requesting abortions. So why do we get in? Oh, sorry, not supposed to do that. Why do we get into a situation where abortion is required? So here we're talking about um, unintended pregnancy. And the definition of unintended pregnancy is um, a pregnancy is unbanned, untimed, or mistimed, or unwanted at the time of con conception. And I've given you a hint there that uh, can you guess how many women have ha had an unintended pregnancy in her lifetime? And often when I ask the audience uh, for this, the, ra the range of uh, responses is you know as low as you know five percent up to about. 50% and actually the, the data that I'm using is from Mari Stokes and they say the 51% of their sample which was uh, the sample size was over 8,000 women um, and 51% of that sample had had an uh, unintended pregnancy. Of course not all of these pregnancies will go on to abortion um, but at the very least, an unintended pregnancy is likely to represent a challenge and a disruption in the lives of the people that are involved. And interestingly, just of this sample that Murray Stokes, um, from Murray Stokes' research, that they also found that 60% of this sample were using some form of contraception at the time that they got pregnant. So by using contraception, they're actually um, taking steps to actively avoid uh, a pregnancy. And we know that the type of contraception that um, people, uh, and mostly that uh, women in Australia are using, because it's women that generally contraception is designed for, are using um, contraception that is not the most effective at doing the job it's designed to do. So the pill and condoms are the most commonly used types of contraception in Australia. And both of these methods require a high degree of user input. For example, with the pill, in order to be effective, needs to be taken every day, needs a script and a supply, and there are rules around missed pills and interaction with other drugs. So they are actually not the most effective form of contraception. The set and forget methods, such as Implanon, which is the implant or an interuterine device or IUD are the most effective and they're cheaper in the long run but again there are numerous gaps and barriers that limit women's options. Um, there are a limited number of clinics that provide these services. Sometimes there's a long waiting list. Um, women often um, rely on their GP to um, make a suggestion about um, um, IUD as a, a form of contraception and the GP themselves might um, not have accurate up-to-date information to be able to promote this method um, to women. So unintended pregnancy is an all too common uh, outcome and that's why we have a need um, for abortion. So as we've seen abortion is a common experience uh, for women and for women who are requesting uh, an abortion. In theory, uh, surgical and medical abortion methods are available and best practice is to support choice of method. But in reality, availability is a bit of a lottery. Abortion services are at best patchy. Um, it depends on the woman's capacity to pay uh, and where the person lives. Um, in reality, the choice of method is a trade-off between personal preference and their resources to hand and what's available in the local area and beyond. And this is where GPs come in. GP services are important because they're often the first point of contact to confirm the pregnancy, to explore choices, and if the decision is to end the pregnancy, ideally the woman or pregnant person would be offered the option of uh, a medical abortion at that point of care. Feedback from the women who have had a medical abortion in general practice is that they experience high levels of satisfaction, appreciate the convenience and continuity of care, and the connection to the cl clinic and the provider provides a context, context of comfort and trust. 
And I'll just finish by saying that the GPs provide a range of sexual and reproductive health services such as contraception care, uh, cervical screening, STI screening, and perhaps antenatal care. And I would argue that abortion is just another component of health care in the spectrum of sexual and reproductive health services. So thank you for that. I'm going to hand over to Sarah Jess, who will be talking about uh, her experience of providing a medical abortion service within her clinic. Thank you, Kath, um, and thank you, Caroline, and, and Jess, too, for organising today. Um, as Kath mentioned, my name is Sarah Jeffs. I'm a GP at the Rosebud Super Clinic on the Mornington Peninsula, and I've been working here since I moved over from the UK eight years ago. Today, I'd like to share my experience of being a provider of medical termination of pregnancy in general practice and the model of care that I use. Thanks, Jess. So um, I'm sure most of you will have had some experience of this patient, whether you're booking them in for an appointment at reception um, or taking their observations in, in the treatment room or seeing them as a GP or later in, the, in a pharmacy. This woman has an unplanned and unwanted pregnancy. Um, and as a GP, we're often the first contact for these women. Now we can all make a difference in these women's experience, um, being empathetic, non-judgmental, listening and giving her the space to ask questions. We can all do this, um, and whether or not we choose to become providers of MTOPS or not. Thanks, Jess. So I've been a provider um, since 2018, um, and our GP liaison consultant, Dr. Joan Newton, invited GPs to express an interest in providing MTOPS. And this was their response to broadening access to women for termination of pregnancy in our area. The strategy being to provide uh, medical terminations in the community with the support of the Early Pregnancy Assessment Service at Frankston Hospital. Thanks, Jess. So the reasons I became a provider are that I'm interested in all aspects of women's health, um, and I've been a provider of contraception and antenatal shared care for a number of years and naturally wanted to include pregnancy advisory and, uh, and, and managing unplanned pregnancies in what I could offer. Having worked in the area too for a while, I recognised the need on the peninsula for this service. I was also keen to help accessibility given finances can be an inhibiting factor for many. And I'll go on on my next slide to talk about the costs, um, which Caroline has also alluded to already. I organized, um, I recognized too that I could provide close follow up and reviews and felt well supported by the extended team through Peninsula Health at Frankston Hospital. Thanks, Jess. So this is a slide of the local services to us on the peninsula. Um, so Hampton Park Women's Clinic um, provides both medical and surgical terminations. But as you'll see from the costs there, you're looking at between 400 to up to um, 700 um, for medical and then surgical. Um, Mari Stopes, um, a medical termination will cost in the region of $560. Um, and a surgical 500. Um, Family Planning Victoria um, do pro provide medical terminations and are more reasonably priced. Um, they are currently just doing all of that through telehealth um, and are bulk billing those telephone appointments, but you will be, um, women will be looking to pay for the ultrasound and the script fee. Um, when they're consulting face-to-face -face again, it will be a $275 charge and there is some med Medicare rebate with that. 
So as far as with the public health services, Monash Hospital is our nearest that provides a surgical termination service um, and they do four a week, but they really do um, try to um, keep these to be able to cater for teenage pregnancies, um, victims of domestic violence um, and women with pension and health care cards. Um, the Royal Women's Hospital is obviously the other um, hospital that offers the surgical termination service. Um, thank you, Jess. So, um, so having decided I wanted to offer medical terminations, I embarked on the training. Um, so from memory, it took about two to three hours and it is free of charge. It is on the Mari Stopes website, which I've detailed there. Um, I then met with our local pharmacist um, and asked if they would consider registering to become a registered dispenser. Um, it's important to have these relationships quite strong um, so that and, and so that you can communicate regularly with one another. Um, I also had a meeting with the facilitators of the Peninsula Sexual Health Hub, which include Kathy Helmarik at, um, at the um, who's the women's health nurse practitioner through Peninsula Health. Um, and we, as a practice, discussed this service in our GP practice meeting. And at this stage, it was really important to recognize individual staff members' personal views and beliefs. Um, we were very respectful to members of staff's views um, and we all um, agreed to support women getting access to appointments with me. Um, and the information that they needed. We discussed how to book women um, inquiring about this service in a timely and sympathetic way. Lastly, I recognized as, um, I registered as a provider with 1800 options, um, um, and um, which Caroline has talked about. Now we decided that um, we would continue with our contraceptive services being openly listed with um, 1800 My Options, but the medical termination service um, was a private listing, which meant that patients would need to ring to get um, our details from speaking to, their, to them. Uh, thank you, Jess. So. The um, the additional services that you need um, are pathology and radiology. So we're able to offer pathology in-house at our clinic. Um, radiology, I've just listed our local radiology services. It's helpful to have had discussions with them to understand what each, each charge and what the rebate, rebate is so that we can inform form all of those um, things to the women who are inquiring. Um, so next slide, thank you, Jess. So this is the summary of the model of care that I work on. Um, and as you can see, there's an average of four patient contacts. Um, now I currently do those myself, um, but there's certainly scope um, within general practice world to be using your practice nurses. And if you're lucky enough to have nurse practitioners um, for these step, for some of these steps, um, and work together. So I have an, initial, an initial appointment, a second appointment where the um, women receive their script. They then have a follow-up blood test at seven days. Um, and that's to check that the hormone level is dropping, the pregnancy hormone level. And then they, we have another follow-up at two weeks. So I'll go into those in a bit more detail now. Thanks, Jess. So, um, without getting too bogged down with some of the detail of um, these appointments, um, I think it's helpful still to summarize them, given that um, there may be some um, people in the audience who are interested in providing some of these steps in both practice nursing um, and GPs. Um, so the initial step, sorry. Lost my slide. Um, so the initial appointment um, is um, 
obviously the first time the women come in about this they will have been asked by the reception staff on booking um, now we decided the two sort of screening questions we would use are is this a women's health related issue um, yes or no and is it urgent um, and I would hope that women would say yes to both of those um, in which case they're accommodated with an appointment within one to two days so in this appointment, um, like most um, GP consultations, I'll take a full history and in particular, you know, really understanding about their sexual history, relationships, any, is there any abuse, any concerns, pregnancy history, what contraceptive options they've tried and, and really explore what options they've considered with this pregnancy. Um, I go through then the, co the contraindications to this medication and there are a few. Um, anyone that's had bleeding disorders, recognised um, inherited bleeding disorders, iron deficiency, adrenal issues or if they're on steroid usage um, or have had previous drug reactions in the past. Um, and in this appointment I'll also discuss the process of what the MS2 step is and how we administer it. Um, and I'll explain what one can expect in the way of the pain, the bleeding and the need for supervision and follow up. Um, so women will leave this appointment more often than not needing one or more of these investigations doing. So um, they do all need blood tests. Um, they have a vaginal swab and a urine infection screen and they need to have an ultrasound. And the ultrasound is to confirm that they are under nine weeks gestation and that it's an intrauterine pregnancy. Um, so I'll also give women printed information to take home with them at this stage too. And in fact, the MS2 step will provide you with lots of patient information booklets, which is what I tend to give women at this stage. Um, I'll book their next appointment as a double appointment so we have more time. And then I'll actually ring the pharmacist and check they do have stock of the MS2 step. So next slide, thank you, Jess. So in this second appointment, again, we'll go through um, what we previously discussed and options and how, what their wishes and feelings are towards the next step. And we'll discuss results of any outstanding tests that they've had done. And I'll discuss the medication again in more detail. So you can register them for a text message reminder, um, which, um, so I haven't gone through details of how we administer this medication, but effectively it's in two steps. You take one set of pills, which stops the pregnancy, and then you take a second lot of pills 36 to 48 hours later, and that induces the miscarriage and abortion. So there is a timed process. Um, and they can be sent a text message reminder from the MS2 step website if we register them for that to, to, to take that second pill. Um, there is also a 24 seven nurse on call number. So if they have any concerns during this period of time, then there's a, a, a number they can ring. Um, I do written consent with the patients um, and I also print a pharmacy letter to go with them with the script which gets faxed back to me once they've had their first pill. So they leave their consultation with me at that second appointment with their scripts. So for the MS2 step, I also give an anti-nausea medication and analgesia. Um, the new guidelines around anti-D is that it isn't necessary in first trimester miscarriage or abortion now. So. Um, we stock anti-D on site because I do shared care antenatal anyway. Um, so that's not such a big consideration. And I give them a blood form for seven days. So we're checking the pregnancy hormone level in the blood seven days after the termination and that's to check that it's dropping. So ideally more than 80%. And then we'll book a telephone appointment for two weeks later or a face-to-face. And I'll give them information about further contraception options at that stage too. Although I'm mindful, I don't want to swamp them with everything, but they will go back, go home with something to read with those two. Thank you, Jess. So um, 
To date, as I, as I mentioned, I've been doing all of these appointments and follow-ups, but having other staff members in your practice um, on board with this who are interested in providing the care to would be really excellent. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's a great way to collaborate and involve them in the service. So the follow-up appointments, as I've mentioned, is a blood test at seven days and then a face-to-face -face or telephone appointment at two days. Now, this really is just touching base, seeing how they found everything, seeing how they are, and also then really focusing on what their future contraceptive plans are. <clears throat> now, if they're keen for the Implanon or com combined pill or depot, we can initiate that then. Um, if it's an IUD that they're keen for, then um, they, I wait seven, four weeks after the termination because um, there's a slightly higher perforation risk in those first four weeks after. Thank you, Jess. So this is just a summary, um, really, and a reminder of the suitability for medical terminations. Um, so women need to be under nine weeks, they need to have adequate um, adult supervision and um, responsible adult for that 48, 72 hours that they're having the medication. Um, they need to be warned of the pain and bleeding, what they might expect and the duration of bleeding and that they need to attend follow up. Um, so in my experience, these, these are the reasons Two, that some women may choose a surgical termination over a medical. Um, more often than not, it's the duration of bleeding that's the reasons why they may not want to um, continue with that option. Nevertheless, for all of the reasons that both Kath and Caroline have already mentioned, it is still a really good option for women it, um, and to provide this service in the community and from home. Thank you, Jess. So this is my second to last slide. Um, and really just a reminder um, uh, to that the termination of pregnancy, it's a really important service um, in, within our healthcare. Um, recognizing it is emotive um, and it is important to understand what feelings it may evoke in your own thoughts and those of your staff. Um, there are different ways of advertising your service and to consider, consider what suits your clinic best. Um, and lastly, I'd, I appreciate there's still much to learn and how we might improve things in our practice. Um, there have been some hiccups along the way, um, which I've tried to learn from. For instance, um, I've had a medical termination patient booked into an antenatal appointment with me. So they've been invited to see the nurse first and have their blood pressure, weight and urine checked. I've also had women attend for their dating scans and being congratulated by the sonographer. So we can't always control for these things, but I have reached out to our local ultrasound providers. And I always make a point of writing on the forms unplanned and unwanted pregnancy and also specifying if the, pre if the patient does, want, does or doesn't want to see um, the scan images and hear that the fetal heart. Thanks, Jess, next slide. So this is my last slide, um, but my first slide too. And really the take home message is that we can all give comfort and confidence to women facing an un unwanted pregnancy. Um, it would be great to join together to provide a more extensive community medical termination service um, with the help of our gynae colleagues in secondary care. Um, the training isn't onerous um, and is free of charge. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I would encourage all GP practices to consider offering this service. Um, and it, if, if it isn't something for them, then to, to have a good grasp of what the local services and providers are um, can make such a difference. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Sarah. I'm just going to go back to sharing my PowerPoint. Thanks so much, Sarah. It's, I think it's really important to hear your experience, your very practical experience of um, the rationale uh, by which you've arrived at the need to provide this level of care and the model of care 
that um, you provide within your clinic because it is a um, it, it, it is a process. Having a medical abortion is a process, um, not just in you know from starting from decision making and as you described involving a couple of other services such as radiology and pathology so that all the investigations are to hand within the consultation and then following through right right through to completion. Um, so um, you know, you, your your model of care is GP uh, led and there I know other services have um, depending on their funding often say in community health there's a greater role for community health nurses, you know, an appropriately trained and skilled up uh, nurse and certainly nurse practitioners um, to be able to provide this level of care. Um, and you talked also about training um, and that is the training uh, through Mari Stokes and that training is directed to uh, medical um, uh, practitioners. Um, and pharmacists as well. Um, in the Clinical Champion Project, we're looking at, um, we have developed uh, some resources uh, to support clinicians in their provision of medical abortion um, procedure, primarily the policy guideline procedure, which is now available uh, to uh, directly to people who are looking at the, uh, the women's website. Um, but if you uh, would like me to send you that P, uh, policy guideline procedure directly. My email is on the on the uh, PowerPoint there. Um, we've also developed some other resources. We're actually in the process of developing some resources that are, will uh, support nurses um, in their role. Um, but, but those things are in development um, at the moment um, and as I say it's just, at the moment it's just the PGP that's available on the website but if you contact me directly I can send you some other resources that uh, have been developed by the project. Um, the, the other organisation that is uh, useful if you're looking into providing this service within your practice is there's an organisation called the Centre for Excellence in Rural Sexual Health and their website is there. They've got a couple of um, uh, resources that would be useful. Um, one is called the Resource Hub. So this is um, a hub for any um, um, policy or procedure, templates for letters, you know, anything that you've ever thought of that's necessary to provide a medical abortion service is most likely to be found on the search resource hub. Access to, is free to anyone. They've also got um, a suite of uh, online modules. They're up to 12 now and one of those is around medical abortion. Um, and again, it's free. You just need to register with the organisation and you get a link to go to the online modules. Um, so that's particularly relevant to nurses because at the moment there's currently no um, sort of resources that uh, provide um, education and training to nurses and, and that's why we sort of we felt that it was necessary to put the policy guideline procedure avail freely available on our website. Um, uh, so take down that, those contact details and we will uh, I'm happy to be in touch to talk with, with anyone. Sorry, I just realised that that was like that. Um, so I'm going to go on to questions and answers and I'll just try to get the chat function um, up. Oh. Sorry. Can you help me here, Jess? The, the, the function, oh, here it is. It moves around the screen and it gets confusing. The last time I looked, Sorry. we didn't have any questions. Yeah, no, so we haven't no got questions. any questions. Um, so, is that because people are thinking that it's? Um, I suppose I'm curious as to what people might be thinking. Whether this is relevant, where 
there's a form, forum within your practice where you could have this conversation with others or you know what's led you to being here and unfortunately in this sort of format you know I can't see you I'm assuming there's people listening <laughs> but um, I'm interested in uh, any feedback about how relevant or what would support practices to be able to provide this level of care do you need more convincing that it's it's a necessary component um, of care And because we've got time, got 10 more minutes. No, no questions. I don't think there was anything in the chat either, was there, Jess? There is a question in the Q&A. Um, oh. Someone has asked, I'm concerned oh. about the costs involved in general yeah. practice. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the cost to the woman or pregnant person requesting that care. Uh, if that's right, well, Sarah might be better off talking to this because she's got her own experience, but that, that is a, identified as a barrier because there isn't an MBS number that will cover this, this level of care. Yeah, yeah, to the practice. Yeah, do you, do you want to talk about that, Sarah? I think that you're in a better position. Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, uh, my own experience is that I am um, working in a bulk billing practice. Um, so the consultations that I refer to in, um, in my talk are um, all bulk billed. So the cost that the um, that women have to, ex to um, prepare themselves for will be the cost of a scan. Um, and, the, and the cost for the script. Um, but if they are on a pensional healthcare card, then um, they do get a slight concession on the scan, um, but you're still looking at about $150 for that. Um, and the script, if they're on a pensional healthcare card, is about five or $6. So, um, I mean, they're out of pocket, maybe between 150 um, to 180 um, in total. Um, now, there would still be flexibility if you are a mixed billing or a private billing practice to bill for those consultations or have a set fee for offering this service, which um, would still be probably less than what, what they are looking at with going to um, one of the other providers that I've mentioned. Um, and it could still be cost effective for the practice, I'd imagine. So I, I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I think it is a fraught area in terms of remuneration um, for the service. Um, the, the, there is another MBS item, which is 4001, and uh, for a GP, um, that is around um, uh, the doing the pregnancy options counselling, they need to do some training to, and to be accredited and registered with um, a, a, as an MBS provider of of that particular number. Um, but the GP will know that, and and there's criteria around it too. But that can offset the cost of some of the early consultation around um, decision making to go ahead or not with a, an abor a medical abortion procedure that could be factored in as well. If you're interested, I've done a, um, a, a, a document that outlines the framework for um, medical abortion care and integrating that into um, a GP practice or, or an outpatient setting. So I'm happy to send that to you. If you just send me an email and I'll send it to you. And I suppose it's also worth mentioning that um, there's various efforts on behalf of advocacy groups. Um, SPHERE is a, a Centre for Research Excellence grant and one of their research components is around abortion and they are advocating um, to um, it's through uh, particularly the Minister, the Federal Minister for Health for MBS 
uh, coding for medical abortion and various other efforts. So the, the issue that you raise is a common concern. Anyone got any other questions? Is there, does anyone feel that this is something they could take back to their organisation and is there a format within your organisation to discuss it or what's led you here today? Also, I'm always interested in, in that. Sorry, I'm just talking to myself there, sorry. Um, if there aren't any more questions, um, I think I was on mute then, but I was just interested if anyone has got any um, feedback around whether this is an issue that they could take back to their practice and whether there's a forum within your practice to talk about this and, and also what's led you here today. Um, no, I couldn't see anyone typing and no hands going up so I'll thank you all for your participation today. Um, thank you to the speakers today, to Sarah and to Carolyn. I think it's been really useful to have your experience of what it what the need is in terms of the information from 1800 and also Sarah, your, your experience of integrating medical abortion into your practice. Um, there's, as I said, there's various resources available. So if you're interested um, and if you feel like you could do with some more support uh, around having this conversation in your practice or other education and training um, opportunities, my email is on the, the screen and also there's Jess from WISE as well. So it seems like there's no more questions, so I'm winding it up now. Thanks to everyone for your participation and I look forward to having further contact with you. There's an evaluation from today's session and that will come up on uh, I think on the screen immediately or sent as an email. Um, Jess, if you want to just say how, yes. how people do the evaluation. Yep, so the evaluation should automatically come up when you leave the webinar and I'll also send out a reminder to complete the survey tomorrow as well. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks everyone. And keen to get any feedback and your evaluation is really important too. Thanks for your participation here today.